if you if you look, you see that the um, the three classes of Jews, basically, um, three classes of Jews is the Hasidim, the Mishnadim, and the Jekim. I don't know, Hasidim, you all know, uh, you know, they do a lot of singing and dancing, you know. Mishnadim, you know, essentially they they learn, you know, they concentrate on learning this and that, and they're pretty straightforward. And the Jekim, as well as the Germans, are very exact. They're very pointless and so on. Where does the name Yeti come from? I don't know. Where does it come from? What? Short jacket or short coat. That was not from? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what it's from. That's a coat. It's not a derogatory term. It's a, you know, it's a community watch and I. So the question that was asked is where, where did this start from, these different cultural patterns? Now you got the good chair there. What? No, it's a bit of a piece of weight. I know, this is probably how long. But, uh, so they say that by Matthew Torah, when the Bodhisattva gave out the Torah, he sent out invitation cards to all of Kaiosol that Matthew Torah will be at 5 o'clock. Oh no. <laughs> so promptly. <laughs> promptly. So the Yekis, of course, they got the green card and they said, well, we believe in, in uh, what do you call it, in, in, in being exactly on time, but even coming before. Make sure that everything is, is alright. So what they did was, they said, there's an Indian of their to, to be there even before it starts. So they came at 4.30. No, 4.30 nothing was going on. They told nothing was going on. So they said, well, you know, they just stood there and so on. So their chilek, because of that, they got their heret. Because it says their heret, Kodma the Torah. Their heret comes before the Torah. So they got their heret because they were very, you know, they were very uh, careful, very curious about coming even before the time. And the start them uh, basically, they were 5 o'clock, so they came at 5 o'clock. Five o'clock started Mount Torah, so it was not them, so, so everyone heard the Torah. Because see them always come late. So they came at 6.30. Now, 6.30 already, Jewish time. 6.30 was all over. The village was given it. So what did they see? 6.30 was a lot of singing and dancing. The big symbol. They were singing and dancing. It's party. So each one took his chalik. <laughs> Anyway, uh, <coughs> uh, this page, page six, is uh, somewhat different than the other ones. Uh, you weren't able to listen to it, so part of page six, uh, unfortunately. Uh, from now on, if any of the tapes are defective, I would appreciate if you bring the tape here. Okay? Give me the tape, and uh, I'll give you another one. Uh, I only have one page six. So, uh, this one. what? Mine is, mine I could hear at this beginning. Oh, we have to go through most of it? Yeah. Okay, but you weren't able to. Okay, so I'll give you the, 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 the tape six. So this tape is somewhat unusual, uh, and it discusses some interesting things. The central theme of this tape is to discuss Elam Haba. What is Elam Haba about? And why does anyone really want to go to Elam Haba? This is a very critical tape, very critical tape, because if you understand what's on the tape and what it's about, you can begin to understand what the essence of Yiddishkeit really is. There are many people who sit and learn and know a great deal of learning. They know Gomorrah's and so on, and in truth they have no idea what it really is all about. Tape 6 tells you really what it's about. It tells you what Ulam Habo is about, but more than that, it tells you how you can capture what's in Ulam Habo, even today, in this point in time. What's the essence of Ulam Habo, really? First of all, Ulam Habo is a place which is essentially working. And in many ways, we can only understand in a very vague way what Ulam Haba will be like. It is difficult to really understand what Ulam Haba is like, as it is to describe a certain experience which is beyond the ken of the rest of your senses. For example, imagine if you had two twins in the womb, 
and they're both talking to each other and one of them says you know I heard that in a short while both of us will go beyond these walls where we are and we won't have any more these tubes to breathe in and we won't be in a sack but we'll be out of a sack and we'll be breathing straight air you know just without this so the other one said well that's ridiculous that's absurd that's impossible where is the text? about Ilum Haba, like we said. And essentially, we cannot really understand what Ilum Haba is because we live in a world of books. We live in a world constrained by five senses. So, how can we understand what will happen in a time when our Nishamas will be absolutely dominant? How can we really understand that? We can only understand it in general, in a partial way, but not in a really specific way. And the essence of Olam Habo really lies in the relationship of the Neshama to the Bonishim himself. This is what you must understand and try and capture. There's a certain type of relationship that the Neshama has with the Bonishim. That relationship, which when operative in its full force, is the most ecstatic and powerful relationship or feeling that you will ever possess in all of your existence there is nothing that you will ever feel even fractionally that will come to that in Elam Haba it's a place where the Neshama relates to the Vanisham directly without any obstacles without any barriers and feels the Vanisham feels God in an imminent way. What does it mean to feel the Vodashom in an imminent way? It's going to take a long time before you understand what that is. When you've gone through a certain number of tapes, many tapes, you begin to understand what's involved in that. There are, is a, it, there are a number of different things. But probably the most common feeling that one feels about it in his relationship to the Bonisham is two things. There's a Hasaga and there's a Hagosha. There's a feeling. There's a Hasaga. The word Hasaga means there is a, it's a mental event. It's a conceptual event. There's a certain type of understanding and there's a Hagosha, there's a certain type of feeling. It is possible to capture that while alive. To the extent that you can capture it while you are living, to that extent you come closer and closer to being what they call a Sadiq. Because that's really what the difference between a Sadiq and a regular person. That has Saga and that has Gosha that one has while in contact with the Bonisham is the most ecstatic thing that's capable of being experienced. Now, let's talk about each of these components. First the Hasada and then the Hagosha. Okay. I'm going to try and give a feel of what that is to some extent. The Hasada. When one is aware of the Bonisham, what is its concept? What is it? Yes, it's very simple, in one word, two words. But we're going to have to talk a good 20 minutes to explain what those two words are. So. If you would ask me what the Bonishim really is, I would say very simply. In an unconventional way, the Bonishim is absolute beauty. Strange. Strange to the try to describe them. You mean absolute beauty, you know? Well, the Bonishim is the creator of heaven and earth. The Bonisham is the source of all power and wisdom. The Bonisham is the source of all life. Whatever you want. But what if we, the Bonisham is absolute beauty? That's really what it is. That's really what it means to know Him. It's to perceive and come in contact with that which is pure beauty. Now what am I talking about? I sound like some kind of poet in the Himalayas. But that's not really what it is. What am I really saying? What do I mean by absolute beauty? Okay, let's go with your experiences. I don't know if you realize it or not, and you probably don't, 
But there are many feelings of beauty in life. There are many things in which you capture a feeling of beauty. Do you ever think some of these things, what they are? And did you ever try and see what's common among all things which are beautiful? For example, a work, a beautiful work of music, a certain symphonic composition. All of you are drawn, I'm sure, to some aspect of music. And there are certain pieces of music which you all relate to and feel in a very sublime sense. Almost as it raises you above what you are. A piece of work of art. There are certain works of art, paintings or sculptures, or buildings, for example. A magnificent building or a structure is also a work of art. A system of ideas. Sometimes, for example, someone explains to you something, and it, it's so clear, it's so organized, it, it's so well put together, that it almost radiates beauty, you see. A landscape radiates beauty. Even things in this world, sometimes the face of a woman may radiate a very profound beauty, you see. Or even sometimes a man, the way he's put together, for example. What exactly really is beauty? In its ultimate sense, what beauty really is, is essentially constituents of a certain basic system which are closely integrated so that they all merge in an exact way and what emanates is something which is more than each of the parts itself. There's a balance. There's an incredible balance among the parts. There's a symmetry. It's not off kilter. But in certain ways, there's an exact equality among these parts. There's a complementarity. The parts come together in a way which is not incompatible, but rather they build on each other and they reinforce each other. You see, the sum total of these various processes project something that we recognize as the beautiful. But if you really think about it, what is beauty? Beauty is really the perception of unity. That's really what it is. When you have a bunch of parts coming together, connecting together in an exact way, where there's symmetry, where there's balance, you see, where there's compatibility, such that the whole is greater than the part, what you see is unity. You see an actor, an incredible unity in the entire thing, a blend, with such an incredible organization. It's not that the things are just organized, but they're organized so that what is radiated is a totality which is greater than the elements itself, where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, not equal to it. It's that totality, it's the image which comes out, you see. It's the total reflection of the thing which comes out, which says, I'm beautiful. I am beautiful because I'm one. All my parts, you see, are in an exact relationship to each other. That's what really what beauty is. And what you observe in all these various different examples is nothing more than the unity of beauty in all these examples. When you listen to an extraordinary symphony, what you listen to is the flow of what? Of notes and tones. But with each tone, is not an isolated fragment itself, but somehow each tone comes from after the other one is succeeded the one before it, in an exact way, in such a way that it, not only you understand that, well, yes, this tone is the proper tone that just follow, and that's the proper tone that you perceive. There's something about the two that's a shidduch, it's a zivuk. It belongs here, you see. In certain senses, even cooking, if I may say, even when you put together a great dish, it's like, the blend of these spices and of these foods, the combination of these various tastes, you see, are not dissonant, but they're consonant. They add with each other. They form, they merge, and they form a unity, you see. It exists in taste, in sound, in sight, you see. It's all in the same way. Now, there's an aspect of beauty which is also subjective, you see. Each of us have a different interpretation of what beauty is. And that has to do with certain aspects of our personality, and we won't go into that. There are very deep ramifications for that, you see. It has to do with the yichud of our neshamas, you see. Because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. 
you see. Because the ability to know beauty has to do with the, the capacity, the innate capacity, or the beauty of the neshama which is beholding. You see. But we're not going to that. Beauty is also an objective thing. And that's really what it is. Now, if one of these things, if an extraordinary symphony by Beethoven's fifth, for example, radiates flawless beauty, if an incredible work of art, you see, by Rembrandt, let's say, also produces an incredible realism, an incredible harmony among its parts. If a building, for example, the symmetry of a building, the design is awesome, a landscape, the universe, a system of ideas, a theory. Einstein created several theories in life. His greatest theories was the theory of relativity in two parts. What's called the special theory and what's called the general theory. The special theory dealt with certain types of problems and resolved that. The general theory dealt with other types of problems and resolved it, but is in more of an advanced nature than on the special theory. When Einstein came out with the general theory, you know what the description of the general theory is? You know what scientists call it? It was the most beautiful theory ever constructed by the mind of man. There was no other word to describe it but elegance and absolute beauty. How can a theory be beautiful? It's intelligent. It's logical. It's true. But what child is such a beauty? Because what it is is when a certain theory explains a series of facts in the most economical way so that there's only those amount of assumptions and no more, you see. And in such a way where by explaining certain facts, instantly many facts that you didn't even deal with are automatically explained as well. What emanates is beauty. In fact, I once read an interesting article in the Times a while back that many scientists when they construct a theory use the criteria of beauty as much as the criteria of internal logic. You see, how do they know if a certain theory is true? If it's beautiful. What does it mean it's beautiful? This is theories we're talking about, man. We're not talking about music. But that's the point. There's unity. Where there's unity of structure, where there's unity of constituents, of elements, there is beauty, you see. And that's exactly what it was. Even, for example, even physically, in a woman's face, you see. Or sometimes when you see all people, some people are, uh, uh, for example, some people are are astonishingly good looking. What is the difference between a good looking man or woman and a person who's mediocre, you see? Sometimes you think that it's the way the face is blended, you see. There's a certain way that the eyes should be with the forehead and the ratio with the jaw bone structure and the entire thing, the whole setup. That there are certain types of structures which are incredibly pleasing to the eye. <coughs> and there are other types of structures which are dissonant. It's like, cool, oh, like, you know, it just doesn't go. There's something wrong here. There's no blend. You see, the parts fight with each other. There's no unity there. There's no shalom on that face. You see, it's the same thing. So therefore, what we see in all these different things is this concept of unity or beauty. Where does it come from? Where does this concept come from? Now, in Hebrew, the word for he- in Hebrew for beauty, does anyone know the word in Hebrew for beauty? What? The first. The first. The first means beauty. Yes. But the word first refers to unity. Where does the word first come from, really? Where does beauty come from, in essence? Beauty comes from the Vodashalam. Why? Because the Vodashalam is the source of absolute unity. What the Vodashalam does is, he touches all these different things and gives them a gift of his unity. They are in some way a reflection of his unity. You see, ideas, tones, images, structures, all of these things have the touch of Ruchnius, of spirit, of his spirit. Because his spirit is unity. And when that spirit distributes itself in a gashmistic way, when it, that spirit comes down to reality, in whatever way it is, suddenly, we see it as beautiful. But what we're really feeling is the internal integrity of spirit itself, of Ruchnia. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? That's what it is, whether you realize or not. Now, if all these things are beautiful, then the greatest beauty of all is the Vodashalom. 
because he is the great unity of all. If we could be mastic what he was, if we could really look at God and know him for what he was, if we could be perfect, that unity I spoke about, where he is his quality, it's such an absolute unity where there's no separation between he and his characteristics. <coughs> we would literally, if we could, which is we can, if we can connect with him as he is, to be understood him as he is by Tuesday, we would be staggered by such a profound, awesome sense of beauty that you will never, could never experience in anything else. <coughs> if you think, take the most perfect beauty that you've ever seen, whether it's music, art, architecture, whatever you want, ideas, take it. The thing which has had the most profound effect on you, right? Take that and multiply it to the infinite power. That's the beauty of God. Because that's what the Buddha Shum really is. He's really nothing more than beauty. And beauty generates value or esteem. Where does esteem come from or value? Value is something that we human beings place on certain things that are important to us. We say it has value. But what value really comes from is beauty. That which is beautiful, beautiful, that which is an internal sense of unity, is automatically valuable. It somehow has a value that emanates from its very internal being, you see. Since the punishment is absolute beauty, everything you created has that, except that we cannot come in contact with that absolute beauty. But we can come in contact with relative beauty, or beauty down the line. The Hasoga of the Vodashon in the Haba <coughs> is nothing more than the Hasoga of incredible preference. And the feeling that you get when you're mastered that stuff is unbelievable. How can we feel that? Simply, go through your life. Think <coughs> about what the thing is that generates this awesome feeling of beauty in you now. And that is an infinite testimony of the beauty that you will behold when you are connected to the Buddha of Elam Haba. Because that's really all Elam Haba is. The Buddha Shem recognized <coughs> when he said that I want to be mated. I want to be mated, right? That's the Anandha Satawa. I want to be given to the Mishama, which has a self that's capable of what? Of grasping that. So the Buddha Shem says, what is the greatest Hatawa that I can give to them? What? So he says, me. I am the greatest pain because I am the greatest perfection. I am the greatest unity and I am the greatest beauty that capable of being perceived in the perception of me, in the closeness to me, in the understanding of me, lies the ultimate beauty and lies the greatest form of ecstasy. Chazal tell us, the Chachaman, the Gemara says, what is Eilam Abba? Eilam Abba is Nenem Ziva Shechina. The Nishamas are in Elam Abba and the Nenea. They have pleasure from the radiance of the Shina. What is the Shina? The Shina is not the Bolisham per se. Rather, the Shina is his Shepha, it's his influence. It's the power which emanates from us, which we connect to. Because we cannot connect to him directly. We connect to that Shepha, which is the influence of his, his light, so to speak, but not him. And when we connect to that, when we feel its radiance, we have the most powerful Hanor, because that Hanor is the perception of absolute beauty itself. Hanor is pleasure. What? Hanor is pleasure. Nene means Ziv Hashina. We have pleasure from the radiance. Ziv is the radiance, Hashina, of the Shina. Why is his influence or his Shepha, his power called the Shina? The word Shina comes from the word Lishkain, to dwell, to reside. A Shachin is a neighbor. You see, a shun is a neighborhood. You see, the radiance of the Bonisham, the shepha of him, is called the shina because that's what dwells among us. That's the part, that's the aspect in which we connect to. That's why it's called the shina. Do we see? The shina is not him; it is his shepha. Shepha meaning his power, his influence, his light. And it's called the Shina because it's that which we connect to. And Olam Habo is to be Nene Mizdiva Shina. Is to what? To go into an ecstatic state 
by connecting their trina. So what is that exact state? That state is what I describe to you. It's literally the perception of absolute beauty. Can you understand what Adam Mahabha really is? Not really. Because the best thing that we can do when it comes to beauty is drink it in drops. You see. We can only drink it through different types and different vessels. Through the vessel called music. Through the vessel called art. Through the vessel called thought. Through the vessel called taste. You see. We can only do it in that way. We cannot drink it through the vessel called absolute truth. Because that vessel is not given to us in a world where we don't see absolute truth because of our senses, you see. So the real beauty, the real thing which will turn us on, to use the vernacular, the thing which has the most powerful effect on us, is still <coughs> hidden from us. understand that. I don't know what I'm talking about. The critical idea and what you must tap, it's going to take a while to happen, is to connect with beauty as you find it in life. But to abstract it from the particular vehicle which is projecting it at that point in time. You see. What? What? When you hear a musical composition, other than uh, other than entertainment, yes. Other than that forms of entertainment, Mahshava, because you know thought. You see, <coughs> for example, take our shear for example, the shear that I gave about the bonus on the side. Would you all say that all of you were moved by it? Would you say that? Mm. Why were you moved by it? Why? Because I was talking about the bonus on. No. You've heard people talk about God before. I'm not the first guy. Why were you so moved by it? Think. <laughs> Would you describe that? Would you say the word beautiful describes that she No, no, no. No, just as a gut left feel. Yes. Would you say that? Why? Why? Because it is more, it is more orderly. Is a more orderly presentation of ideas than we are accustomed to. Is that what it is? Because I presented a more orderly, because I was organized in my presentation? Because you didn't say That's anything we didn't understand. No, or is that it? Is that it? We understood all of the things, but they, they were more orderly. I hear what you're saying, but is that it? You would, oh, oh. first time again? Shlomo. Shlomo. Would you, would you, would you agree with Shlomo in this case? Yes, and in addition, it is matter Okay, who want, who would disagree or not disagree? Who would say there's something else? Orderly. Can't describe something just plain orderly and beautiful. It's logical, it's rational, but it also could be very dull and uh, and boring where this was alive and it, was, it wasn't just an orderly statement of facts one after another it was a it was part of an organic whole of the system that was weaving together different strands of, of uh, information to one organic whole that, that had life as well yeah I was very the impression of being fundamental to present it in a concise fashion without where in everything is brought together. Okay. I want you to see what was the enjoyment? What that? Do you enjoy that? What do you mean? <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's, 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 it's only compliments, so it's like, I wish I had this. I don't think it's a compliment. I don't think I was only kidding around. I, uh, I realize you're being objective. You're really being objective, but I'm not, I'm not fishing for compliments. I know, I understand that. I'm not, I'm not saying you are, but I was just saying we don't want to get to the only point. I'm trying to get to the only point. I'm trying to get to the only point. I'm trying to get to the only point. Well, you should have been there. No, no. No. That's not, that's not why the show was beautiful, you see. That's not what it was. 
It wasn't because I was orderly and organized. I can be very orderly and organized and it sounds good. But there was something else. There's something else. And I'll tell you what it was. We're all accustomed to thinking about the Bonnet You see. But the Bonnet fundamentally is an idea. It's an idea in our head. And also, there are certain qualities that it possesses. What I succeeded in doing is a strange thing. By showing you, in a sense, who the Bonnet was, I succeeded in jumping from the concept to the power of his being. That's what I did. In other words, what we did for the really an interesting thing was by understanding his yichud, his unity, you see, the nature of being who is his quality, and so on, and therefore his absolute independence. Suddenly, as soon as we understood this, we suddenly recognized why he's God. And we suddenly recognized that that, we suddenly recognized and we can feel the awesome power that would naturally emanate from that kind of a being. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what we're able to feel. It was a merger of the concept, you see, to the feeling of the being itself. That's what I succeed in doing, you see. Of course, I organized the discussion in a very interesting way. That, see, but that's not what it was. The spirit that came out of that Shia was that you were able to actually feel God by understanding Him. You see? And that itself is a unity. You see, I did? That's what it is. That, that itself is a unity. So, just by understanding Him, you almost felt like you were in His presence. You could actually feel the being. It's almost like you can see Him and sense Him by knowing Him. And that's a very unusual thing. You see? The knowledge of something is really separate from the experience of it. You see? But what I did was to merge the two. And what happened was to know him is to actually experience him in a very strange way. That is beautiful. Why? Because there's an incredible unity to the thing. You see? Am I correct? That's how I see what the that she was. It was more than just the delivery. It was more than the emotion or the drama. It was much more than that. It was the content. It's what I did, you see. It's that I was able to make you feel him by understanding him. To know is to feel. And that's a very strange merger, you see, that then really happens together. Would you agree with me that this is what it was? I think this puts the finger on it. It's subtle. But I think this is really what it is. Yes. Or would you say that in terms of, of, of any form, you lose a guy, anything that creates yes. a feeling. Yes. That's yes. the whole thing. That's the whole thing. But I created feeling by thought. With the thought right? Yes, that's very unusual to create. And I didn't just create just a feeling. I created the feeling of God. I created almost a sense of what the divine must be. I created almost an awe and a reverence. You see. Just by the understanding. You see, why is that a spirit? Because you know how long it takes to feel all for God? You see, you can sit and read all the books you want. It would take you years to feel all in love with Him. You see, Moshe Rabbeinu said to Kalisov, Moshe Hashem Shorim Mukho, what does God ask of you? Keep the Yura. The only thing He wants from you is simply to what? To fear Him. That's what He says. Keep in the Yura. All He asks is simply to fear Him. To have all in love with Him. So the Gemara says, what do you mean, key him, simply to, you see, and is the fear of God a simple thing? My God, it takes years and years of work, you see. So how can Moshe say, simply to? So the Gemara answers, because as far as Moshe is concerned, it's simple. You see, Moshe was with certain with respect to himself. What does the Moshe want? All he wants is simply to have reverence and awe. What is the reverence? Reverence is all means in constantly in your daily life. When you walk around, you constantly have a reverence and all for God. We don't even have reverence and all when we're in shul. Forget about when we're outside. You see? You see what I'm saying? So the Gemara says, for Moshe Rabbeinu it was simple. But, hey, you are Shemayim. Your fear of God is a very, very high objective. It takes years and years of work. You see? It really does. But I succeeded in doing it in an hour to those who understood the shear and really were zapped by it. I really did. For a brief moment, 
you had fear and you had reverence because you saw the power of the being you see you can see the power you can see the, the aspect you see of the being of the Buddha himself why? because I described to you his unity I described to you what that means what it means to be God to the best way that we can understand and when you saw that suddenly you saw Malchus you saw an absolute monarch a true sovereign an ultimate sovereign you see and that's what you felt and that's what you can see and that's why it was beautiful because it captured the truth about the body show by giving you the truth not as a thought but as a feeling you see now you can capture it once but it escapes you you want to get it again this is the tape over and over again. Think on that. Work on that. Before you daven, think on that tape. And you will slowly capture it. Slowly will become a ritual. It will call into you. And gradually, it will open up the hidden eye of the Neshama. Because strangely enough, we can't see God. He's invisible. But the Neshama sees the Vodashara. It does. But it has a third eye, which is closed. We have to open that eye. You see? Because you can feel God through your neshama. Literally. It is possible. And that's what Elam Haba is. You see? And one aspect of that is what? One aspect of this is first. You see? It take a long time to grasp that. We'll go through 60 takes before you finally sing. But it will come home. You will get it at the end. You see, if you stick with it, you will get it. You will understand a year from now what I was talking about today. You see, but then it will stay with you. And you will have grasped a piece of what Urdu Mahabha is like. Yeah. I was just wondering, I was so impressed with the idea of the fair. I don't understand much about the fear. It's not from the fair. It's not in the mind. Forget about the fear. That's a good the sphere as first is a whole different thing. Forget about it. The word here is used in a different sense. I'm using it in a gut sense, what we know it as. And that's it. So anything in the creation mm-hmm. yeah, that reflects balance and orderliness or uh, unity. Yeah, for so example. That reflects so godliness. Look, yeah, look at your outfit. If I, if I may be personal, look at your outfit. You've got dark gray pants, maroon tie. There's a nice fit to your clothes. The colors are well matched. There's a certain force that comes out of that, whether you realize it or not. Why? It's not a profound beauty. I'm not overawed by it. But there's a pleasant sense that comes out. Would anyone agree? At least I see in the colors, no? It's a nice balance. But more than that, the colors have a nice blend. I mean, don't get a bad. <laughs> the colors have a nice blend, you see what I'm saying? The maroon with the gray and the way, it's the whole thing, right? The solid and the stripe, you see. That's what my wife said. What? She bought it. She got good taste. <laughs> got good taste. You see, that's beauty. It's not awesome beauty, you know what I mean? But you understand what, what the feel is? Beauty is in many, many things. There are many things which are in their beauty. Isn't everything? What? Isn't there beauty in everything else? Yes. But yes, not not totally. The more discordant something is, the more distant thoughts apart, the more it lacks beauty. It's not in everything. No, it's not. It's not in totally everything. Okay. For example, your outfit is not as pleasing as his. Maybe our mind is even less. But I don't know. You see. But it's not in totally everything. You see. There are things you would say that are more beautiful than others. Wouldn't you? That depends how you're looking at it. No, well, wouldn't you say there's a thing that's a downright... Shvach? Yeah, and if I did a problem... Shvach? Well, I mean, you know... I mean, there's no question, you know? You know? That puts me the face lift or something like that. I mean, there's no question. That those clothes need... I mean, forget about that outfit is ridiculous. You know what? That, that, no, that, that those music, that's not music, that's noise. You know? You know? There are things that don't have radiant beauty. The more discordant the parts, you see. So what I'm telling you is this, is that in, in, 
if you, if, if, if ultimately it's beauty, there's wuchniyus in there. The blend, the kaya behind that is wuchniyus, it's kedusha. Because the only thing in all reality which can radiate beauty is kedusha. That's the essence of kedusha. You remember the tape, the tissue bulb tape? Mm-hmm. Remember that? Yeah. First, the outsole, first is beauty. But where does it come from? Kedusha. Because that's what Kedusha is. Kedusha is the aspect of Ruchnius, or spiritual substance, which because of its unity, it radiates beauty, you see. But, that's how we know the presence of Ruchnius. And I tell you this, anything which is beautiful has Kedusha in it. That's the mistake that people make. People think that just because there are many things in the world that look like they have those shaykhs to Ruchnius, you know what I mean? Like, a beautiful building, let's say, or something like that, or, or certain things, or chokhmah, a girlish chokhmah, you see, or whatever the story is. We think there's no beauty in it. What's that? That's the good kedusha. That is a mistake. If it had no beauty, if it had, it could not have any ruchnias. Because nothing can radiate beauty but ruchnias. You see, it's even in a, an outfit, even in a bunch of clothes as they come together. Whether you realize or not, the kolkas, or the forces of ruchnias, you see, which allow that blend to project that pleasant sense is Ruchnia. You see what I'm saying? There's a big problem in what you said. What's the problem? Since we are, since it is the Gashmir that projects the Ruchnia. It's true. That's right. And we are in control of the Gashmir. That's how it appears. So it appears, right? So it, okay, but but uh, you know the the, the uh, you are not in control. No, you are not in control. Of it. I, I I heard this. No, what I was saying is that I am in control of um, arranging, okay, uh, my what I uh, uh, think I exercise uh, dominion over in but where, this world but where do you in get a certain way. Yes, yeah, but where do you get your judgment from? Uh, How do you know? No, 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 that's the that's book book book. Book. That's book. Book. So what I'm going to do is simply arranging something, whether it be flowers or books on a shelf, right, in a certain way, yes. you're going to, right, and you're going to walk in and you're going to see this, that's going to cause a response in you that you're calling Lukhni, yes. to Paris, or not. Right? Or so I can exercise Jesus. control over you Yes. Right? By influencing... Yes. yes. In a sense you can. Right. In a sense you can. But in a sense, it's more than that. A great... In a sense it's more than that. A great composer, you see, is able to create his music because he has an ashama which is able to tap the ruchnias, the form, the unity behind the tone. He can feel it, he can read it, and his brain brings it down as a composition. A great mind, you see, is able to see the unity behind the ideas, behind the facts, and so on. But where does he get the color from? Because the Neshama has the access to that Ruchnius, and it translates that Ruchnius into a certain level of Gashmius to the beauty, where the Gashmius is the vehicle of the beauty. That's where it's watered from. Yes? So, what you're saying is you take someone who's an atheist, he needs to be the man, the man is, when the man talks about all things, poetry, the beauty of the of words, of phrases, and so on. You all need it. This is all Wachnius. You see. Why is it Wachnius? Because we've said we've established the basic principle. The Kurkas of Ra cannot exist on its own. In order for Ra to exist, the eighth one must come on to what? To Kedusha. But when Kedusha has, has beauty and Yicho, you see, through when it comes through the eighth hour, it manifests itself in Gashmias. So when you look in the Gashmias and you look through the things, you think that you're looking at a Yeshua's Mabadu as a, as a Geshmiki thing, as a Ra. You know what I mean? But in reality, you're looking at its source of life, which is Kedusha. Because it needs that. Tuma cannot live on its own. It's impossible. It must draw its clear from the Kedusha. See. And it radiates it. So an atheist thinks that what well, I see beautiful, I see incredible beauty in the universe. Or he creates it, or he paints it, or whatever. Yeah. He composes it. Yeah. 
So what you're saying is that the riot comes together with the... It's merged, of course. Sure, because the riot cannot survive on its own. Except it's merged in such a way as it's concealed. So that it looks like it's not the beauty of Ruchnius, it's the beauty of Gashmius. Almost as if Gashmius has a beauty onto its own. Separate from Ruchnius. So these and are two purposes. It all comes together then. So that's what the eight are so How does the eight are as war? How, how can the eight are seduce you? He can't seduce you with his Tumor because there's nothing to Tumor. He seduces you with his Kedusha, which is behind him. But he takes the Kedusha and weaves it into a different pattern. You see, into a Gashmius, into a book, into sense perception. So you think, it nature of Vardai. You think, where is God? I don't see God, but I see beauty, I see organization. Uh-huh. But you think that that beauty is a Gashmius thing of beauty. It's a Yitzhahor, it's a heft of beauty. You think that beauty exists unto itself, separate from God, that there is no God. But the Bonisham created the situation like that, so that you would have free will. Because if you can only see beauty from where it is, if every time you saw beauty, you saw a rookie from Kedusha, what would be left to your free will? So the you the opposite apply? So the human is to believe in man, and all these great things that man has done. I really see the Kedusha, but they're just the same, that it's yes. man. What I am telling you is a very strange concept, but it's a very deep concept. You see, most people are from it, and this is what you're pointing out to, and this is very critical. It'll take me six months to hammer this to your head, but once it's hammered, you will be able to feel the pulse of Vukhnius in a way which is different than anyone else. Why? Because most people are from say, well, the base medish is where God lives. God lives in the base medish. God is not in the world. Ah, the world, Seth, Puma, Choshech, Lies, Sheka. That's what they're all about. College, Sheka. The Chochmah, the Goyim, Physics, Science, Biology, Sui. That's what they're saying, you know what I mean? Terror, that's where it is. The base medish, that's where it is. You know what I mean? Art, ugh. Music, going to music. Right? But you must understand the, the true depth of the thing, you see. You must realize one thing. I am Jewish. You are Jewish. But God is not Jewish. It sounds strange. God is Jewish. God is God. You see, God is the source of everything. He is the creator of everything. Everything which exists is from His hand. Goyim, Jews, Catholics, Hindus, Yoga, whatever the story is, Tumor, it's all from Him. Wall Street, 42nd Street, Attila the Hun, Attila the Hun, Jesus of Rome, Moshe Rabbeinu, Jesus, Muhammad, we are it all, it's all from the Burmi Oilam. You see, the what? The, the creator of the world, the Burmi Oilam. It's God that's in everything. That doesn't mean that everything which is there has equal legitimacy. That's what the point is. What has legitimacy, the Rotten Aboyer, what the politician said, my Derek, the way I want you to be. The method, the manner which I describe, which you will be closest to me, is called Judaism. But I'm not Jewish. You see what I'm saying? You see the difference? Your tasks, your path, your purpose, the essence of getting close to me, that's called Judaism. But I'm not Jewish. The from Jews think he is. The from Jews think that God is Jewish. What? In a sense, he is the base medish. Only in the way, in what I mean, he's in the base medish. How? He's the base medish. That his light, his rotten, is through the Torah. That's where it is, you see. That's where the thing is. But there's a difference. Except that everything that he made has a purpose and fulfills a divine will and is leading towards an objective, which hopefully we will understand as we proceed in this course. You see, and as we show up each week, and as we come on time, uh, you see, that's what that is. Yeah, what? <laughs> okay, you will gladly understand that, but you must understand there's a difference in what the Buddhism demands of us, 
and what he is in himself. You see, but it takes a very broad mind to understand this. Most people are from a very narrow, a very provincial, but they have to be that way because they're frightened by what they see outside. When they took a look at a, when they take a look at an IBM computer and they see the incredible complexity, the brilliance engineering and technology which exists in this, or they see the space shuttle going up, or they see what the, the power of what's possible, and they say, we don't do this, we see the base message, and they say, what is this? Where does this Kochma come from? This can't be God! Because this is awesome! But the Torah is awesome! You see, but this is not the Torah! There's a problem, there's a problem of relating with the rest of the world! What they don't understand is, that's all the Torah. Except, the Bonisham has punished Kali Sroll. On Tisho, that's what it's about. That whatever the Bonisham punishes Kali Sroll, the Torah shrinks. In your head. It gets smaller. So you no longer can understand how the space shuttle, and how IBM computer, and how the DNA molecule, and all of molecular biology, and so on and so forth, is a reflection of the Yichon HaBoyre. You can't see it anymore. You see, so it's used just the Goyim, and it's used by the Goyim, you see, for their own purposes of Sheka and Atheism. And our Torah has shrunk to a little thing, you see. So we're frightened, because we can only see the Torah as a small thing, and we look at the rest of the world, and we don't understand it. We don't understand where it fits in the Torah. So what do we say? That, it's Sheka. Well, how can it be Sheka? How? You see, what? Is God absent in that part of the world? you see what I'm saying? If we see the Torah this way, it's our Einish. It's the Dalit. It's the poverty of Torah Israel. You see? That's what Olam Haba is. Do you understand what I say? You understand Olam Haba. Because Olam Haba is the Torah stretched where you understand how it incorporates everything and how everything is from the Bonishon and reflects his Yichon you see the feeling of that Yichon when you see the unity you see when you can see the Bonishon in a sense in that well balanced outfit you see then you begin to understand that the Bonishon is everywhere and why it's called Hamakam the place he is everywhere, in everything. He is not identical with anything, because he is beyond it. But his Koyach is in everything. His Kedusha. And therefore his Tferet. How do I know that the word Tferet means Yichud? That's on the Pesach. It says, the Bonishim says to Kalisov, Ki sitcha el yola korabayam. I will raise you from among all the nations of the world. The shame. In name in reputation with Seferis and in beauty with Sila and in trade that's what it says you ever daven you ever daven when you daven on Shabbos you say L'chor Dodi right what's L'chor Dodi at the end Shom of the Zohar Hashem Echad Zedim Echad Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad the name of God and he are one what's the last word the shame with Seferis with Sila you see the word the first? The word first, the shame first, you know, where is the team and first? Hashem Achad Ushmoyachad. When we understand the unity of the Bodh Shalom, that's where the first radiates. And that's where the word first exists. The word first is the direct reflection of Yichod. And it's always one connected other. But what Yichod? What first? The Yichod of the Bria. That's what Elam Habo is. Olam Abba is the ultimate ability to see the beauty without narrowness. Without saying, I can see the beauty in this vehicle, but not in that. It's the ability to see behind all vehicles. To see the Yad, the power of the Yvonne himself. And when you see that, you will be so wiped out, you see, by the enormous power, you see. Because when we say, oh yeah, well, of course God is everywhere. You know, it goes everywhere. I don't believe God is everywhere. But I'm not telling you that he's everywhere. I'm telling you how he is everywhere. He is the intricate design of every phenomena and every process and every operation, you see, and every entity which exists. 
He is the design. That's the reflection of his spirit. You see, of his yichud. That's where he is. It's your ability to capture that unity, to capture that all pervasive design, is to capture the power of his hands and the power and the presence of his being. That's the Mahaba, without any blindness, with full perception of what he is. You now understand what I say when I started and I said, what is God? Absolute beauty. Yes. Now, let me ask you. This year is also beautiful for the same reason. Because what do I do? I don't simply mouth things. God is everywhere. You know? I don't. I show you His presence everywhere. And when you understand it, suddenly you feel it. I've merged thought and feeling together so that you can actually feel and experience the presence of the Bonashama. Spirit. The shame of the Spirit of the Kira. You see, that's what it is. The Shear itself is my evidence that what I'm saying is true. <laughs> Yes. I appreciate the comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I want to know though, what's wrong on now is that he like, married a magician uh, knowing that this magician and everything. Then 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 it comes out to something like that. I don't that you tried out Shlomo's try they somehow Shlomo had some type of form trying to raise the Kedusha in all, in all things. So how do we know, knowing that this Kedusha and everything, how do we know where to throw the one? You don't. It's not, it, you don't. Now you don't, it's not your business to go after it. That is the essence of the Mashiach, and specifically the Mashiach in Yosef, which we learn about later on, who draws back the prayer, everything in the Bria, the spirit of the Bonishon, and everything in the Bria, you see. Where do we see that? Okay, let me tell you one little drusha. It's not a drusha, it's what the thing is. What is the true time, the messianic time? Okay? It says about Yosef. Yosef. It says about Yosef in the Brochus of, uh, in the Brochus, Bechor Shere Yechodoloi, the Kane Re'en Kanal. Bechor Shere, Yosef is compared to the elder of a shaw, a shaw of an ox. And when Yaakov left and Moshe when they left Yosef they said Yosef is compared to an ox <coughs> to an ox to the firstborn of an ox and Yosef is also compared to what's called a rain. a rain is a wild ox it says before Shoei Hodoloi Yosef is like the firstborn of an ox the Kani Re'en Kanov and his horns are like the horns of a wild ox Bohem Amin Menagah. He will go nations with them. That's what it says. Now, what does Rashi say? Rashi says there, what is this ox, wild ox? What is it? So Rashi simply says like this. Rashi says that the horns of an ox are different than a wild ox. If you ever look at the horn of a bull, it's short and stout. It's strong. You know, you ever look at a bull, it's short. It's very powerful, you know, it's based very powerful. But the horns of a aim, a wild ox, is like an antelope. It's long, elongated, it's just beautiful the way it is. So the horns of a shore represent strength, oiz. And the horns of a wild ox, a aim, represents beauty or spirit, delicate. You see, it's delicate. Jesus, therefore, said to possess oiz and spirit. Why? Because it's the purpose of Yosef to take the Kedusha from the world and bring it back. Remember we said that the Oiz and the first, which are the fundamental kinds of Kedusha, where are they? They're in the hands of the Goyim. They're in the hands of the world, you see. It's Yosef's job to take it back. That's why Yosef has the ability to take back the strength or the power of the Goyim and reduce them to impotence. And he has the ability to take back the Chochmah and the spirit of the Goyim. And when he does that to the Torah, he enlarges the Torah to its ultimate boundaries. You see, but that's an extraordinary ability. 
That's not your ability. Nor can you even do that. But all I'm simply doing is giving you a spark of what that ability is. So you should understand that the Bunishim is everywhere. But how is he everywhere? He's everywhere by the internal design and structure of everything which he made reflect his hand. That's his presence. His presence in creation is the manifestation of its internal design and its internal beauty. That is the reflection of the Bunishim in there. And we are at a level where we cannot see that. That will be restored to us in the Yemen Mashiach. And it will be known to us in a perfect sense in Ulam Abba. You see, we cannot know that now. But we can at least feel it. We can sense it. We can know that it is. And by knowing that it is, you see, you will really begin to understand the true sovereignty of the Bodhisattva. But how is all, what's our guidelines being that the Mashiach and Yosef is that to do that? When you come to these shurams for one year straight, you ask me that question again, and you will understand the guidelines. Yes. I don't mean that facetiously. It will take a long, huge amount of information for you to, to know before you can begin to work with that. Suffice it to say that you understand what I've said now. Hold that. Absorb that. You see. And that's sufficient for this point in time. I didn't hear a vision of the shirt. The tide is all together. What you see me is the strength, the perception of beauty was taken away from the yes. young, and it's more became the I will give you, you the I, I, shall, I shall give you the vision of the That's yes. the one you gave two weeks ago. Right? That's the one I gave, yeah. You know, you, oh, you came after? I came a week after. Okay, I'll, I'll give you I'll that. Right yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, that's only one half of the problem. Then my thought and I said there's two parts to it. What? That's right. Now comes the chaser. <laughs> okay. But the truth of the matter is, I think it's special about at least the last next week. We can have to sell for the whole share. And I don't want to dilute it by working through time. What? You all, uh, you all, you all. Well, if you do it, I, I'll, it's going to take me a good, uh... Okay, say it's not a large job. It's not good job. You can't pull it out from okay. here. No. But you, you can understand, you can feel that it's there. You could know what it means that the body is there. You can, and that's what first means. You see, and that's what Earl of Harbour is. That's the beginning of Earl of Harbour. What case comes to our road? Where you get to our road? Page 65. <laughs> 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 Do you kind of get the feeling that I'm trying to go with you to continue your trip in the end? Then I kind of get that feeling. No, it's not that. You don't say it. I laid down, when you guys started, I laid down certain guarantees. I really did. If you people are loyal to the Shum, I will deliver something that's very unique. When you finish, you will understand. You will literally be able to look at Wuchnir when you're finished. Mm. And I mean it. You have to look it through your eyes and you will understand it and you will feel it and you will see it and recognize it. Mm. And I, I will deliver that. And more, you can see even from the lips that you know, Judaism doesn't sound the same anymore. It's almost like a different religion. It's slowly. By the time I'm finished, you know, when you say Judaism and everyone else says it, everyone else says it, it will literally be a different religion. Because what you will have and it's very difficult to obtain. And you guys are an experiment. <laughs> Seriously. I, 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 I'm really the, you guys are really an experiment. And I know what's going to succeed. Is I want to open up that third eye. I want to give you a people a taste of what will be in a different time. And in a different way. And it can be done. Okay. But I need your commitment. I can't do it. It means I need your steady attendance. And I need you to listen to each tape on the week. You see, I need you to work on it. If you feel that's worth it, you've got to do the work. It's the very minimum of work I ask in terms of what I'm going to deliver. You should know. But I've got to do that. You see. Okay. That seems to me to be very, you know, like an awesome experience. And there are always been in every generation a few people who sort of been aware of this. I think like we're almost like breaking. That's the basis of what I could, I could. And why? I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, 
That's a good question. You know, that's a good question. But the answer to that question also was after page 40 to 50. Just to understand why is really also in some order. Suffice to say that we are going to try something which is very unusual. Why is it that we're Zoycha in this attempt? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know what each one of you have done to merit it. And it's a schut to be here, whether you realize it or not. Wow, really? If you understand what I'm saying, it is that. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm not saying that I'm in, in, in any way. To understand this, which comes from the Ramchal, in this way, is a schut because most people are not given to understand that. Will you be able to relate to the world? Yes, you will. But not only that, there will come a time when you will be judged on this. And I'll tell you now, and this is the thing, it sounds funny, but as we go further and further, you will get fixed in the and there will be many things that will be given to tests and attempts by the eight hours to take you away. You should know, not far in the future, there's going to be powerful attempts to pull you away. God knows for whatever reason. Why? Because this stuff is very dangerous. To who? To the eight of her. Why? Because it's very, it, it's a kind of understanding that, that literally gives you the ability to begin to handle them or set you know, and therefore it, it puts you on a different level of your soil. You see? Right. means a test or trial. You see? Mm-hmm. Because when you begin to see what he is, he has to do much more to entrap you, you see. But would suffice for any guy who knows nothing, who goes walking around like a total dummy, you know what I mean? Totally immersed in life and in gushiness and that stuff. It's very easy to trip that guy up, you know what I mean? It's not much there. But if you feel the wokeness and you get to see, it's not easy. Now the ASO is really thinking, you've got to work overtime next week. Because how do you get a fool you now that the rest of the world is no shock to the punish on them? The whole gimmick of gashness and goof is to show you, wait a minute, God is not here. He doesn't exist in this world. You see? Show me. Show me, I'm from St. Louis. Show me where he is. Right? That's what he's saying. That's what he says to you. He doesn't say it outright, but that's what's inside. You see? But what's he going to do next week? What's he going to do now? Because when he comes to you and says, you say, wait a minute. The essence of the design the beauty of the thing. That's his presence. That's his yichud. He is now in deep trouble. Well, when I mean deep trouble, I mean only in the sense that he's got to work harder. He's got a lot more ammunition where that comes from, you know? But I'm saying, you know, you know, don't worry. But I'm saying is, as you move up to a new level, he's got to move up to a new level. You see? As the Chazal say, Chazal God Mechavero, Yitro God Lemeno. The bigger somebody is from his colleague, the bigger his nature is from the colleague. The bigger you are from the man next door, in terms of Jesus Christ, right? In terms of your understanding of Rukhness, the bigger your nature becomes with respect to the other guy. What do you mean bigger? It doesn't mean necessarily more powerful, it means more subtle. The nature of a big tzaddik, you see, it's not necessarily more powerful than your Yetara. Mm-hmm. It's more subtle. Mm-hmm. It's much more difficult to distinguish. Wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Is it a Yetara? Or is it a Yetara? You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's where it is. So that you have to distinguish between your inner feelings. Why am I doing this? For my own covers? Because I really want to see the Yerush Why? You know what It forces you to go into yourself deeper. To know yourself better. It's more difficult to get them out of your hair because the lights become embedded in the roots. They don't live on the hair. They're in the roots now. Go pick it up, you see. That's the difference. The higher you go, the deeper he goes. To counteract it. That's it. I'm going to ask a question about uh, yesterday. Yeah. Sure, I'm an expert. So. <laughs> <laughs> Me and him? Best of friends. <laughs> I see him join them. What? <laughs> My own friend, huh? So, so, if the, uh, so all things in the Bria are potentially, have, potentially have the ability to reflect Paris. 
one, one level or another. And we are uh, on this level uh, in a position to manipulate these things so that they can be positioned in such a way as that they can reflect to Sarah. Right? Yes. Well, we're not reflecting well. For example, if I went through this room and I overturned everything, it would reflect less Sarah. Yes. And it does right now. Texas okay. So there's the oh. question of the yes, the her is. Right? So that when I realize this, and I'm and I'm and I'm confronted with a with a chaotic situation in the physical yes. realm, very basic physical realm, that it is and it is within my power to remedy that, right. to make it more orderly, so that it reflects more to her. So what if I don't do it? Why do you have to do it? Why should you do it? Why? Wait, 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 why should I do it? It's so that there should be more, it should reflect the No, it's your more job is not to create the Ferris in Zria. That's God's job. Your job is to create the Ferris in you. In you. And when do you reflect beauty? When? When you reflect Kedusha. When your mind comes close and closer to the unity of God. And to the Kedusha. And to Ruchnit. And to the truth. It begins to reflect itself in you. You become a spirit. That's your job. The real creation, the Bunisham says, leave that to me. But, more deeper, to the extent that you reflect spirit in yourself, to that extent it is reflected in the Bria. And like I told you last time, it says, Tamil Chachamim create peace in the world. That's what it says. Tamil Chachamim That's what it says. Peace in the world is brought by Tachamim Tamil Chachamim. How? It's in the base message. What are they? Politicians? Diplomats? Political scientists? What do they have to do with bringing peace to the world? The answer, because when they learn and they dove it to the Barachalam, when they bring themselves close and close to the Barachalam, Kedusha is brought down to them and from them into the world. And as Kedusha goes into the world, the world becomes more peaceful. Because which is the greater reflection of beauty? A world of peace and at harmony with each other, or a world of war and at strife? Which is the reflection of the community of man? What defines or describes the community of man as the totality? Peace. That's what peace is. What is peace? Peace is a spirit in the minimushi, in the totality of the species of man. That's really what it is. How do you bring it? In yourself. Doesn't it also say that a Thomas Hachem, that you shouldn't even have a speck of dust? Like That's that. something else. That's something else. That's not in the first. That's in the other world. That's the other world which are similar, but there are other things. The system, because I'm just trying to give you a feel for this first as it exists. Your job is to bring it first in you. That's your job, and the main is going to the clear. But you don't have to clean the room to have first. That's not what you have to do, really. Although, in a higher level, that would be true. Cleanliness is next to godliness, because cleanliness is supposed to be first. Yes, but I, I don't want to go into the exposition of these things in terms of that. I don't want to do that. To do that already would be to, just to uh, dilute it. Let's keep it with attack. Just understand first in Chochma, in music, in art, you see, in, in many things. Even in Taiva, it's first. It's first even in Taiva. Taiva. Pleasure. In pleasure itself. Because there is. There's pleasure in Taiva. What? There is. It's deeper. It's more hidden. There is. What? In taste. In Taiva Vachida. Even in sexual Taiva. There is a first. A woman's form or figure has an inner spirit. You see, we get this in the Taiva also, doesn't it? But the two of us are connected, you see. Well, that's not really getting right out my question. Where does the balance of you said on the face, I think it's a very good point to engage our upholstery and behind and uh, back and front and so forth. Where, where, how does the balance develop? You'll have to listen to the fishing up here. It no, depends on your mindset. His, his ability to dwarf in Kedusha depends on the sins of man. The more sins we commit, 
the more we go away from the Bonachalam, the more powerful it is the ability to manipulate the Kedusha and draw the first within himself into a hidden form. Mm-hmm. Okay. The town now the town talking is Martin Shalom in the world. Who? The town of Martin Shalom. Now the one that says the one that's sitting in the big is that the fact so the so the computers and all the things that are happening in the chair for the coin. So half so what so half of the Martin Shalom is these twenty things fat. So the because it's not necessary to see the first and everything else. What is basically necessary is his ability to relate with the Bodhisattva. But his inability to see first and everything else is a, is a, is a poverty. It's, a, it's, a, it's an English. It's a punishment. His eyes are closed. They're dim. But that's not what the Bodhisattva wants. The reason why we can and cannot see the first, to the extent that we can, Depends a great deal to do with what's called the Kugum on Kylosol and so on. This will not become clear to us until we finish page 7 and 8 and we go on to the second series and especially the third series. That's when it really begins to hit home what all this is about. We have to leave these topics. What controls the amount of spirits in the world and the ability to see this first? The ability of the Jews to see it and how much is in the hands of the Goyim and in the hands of the Sultan and in our hands. I have to do a serious